Hello and welcome to the Research Match webinar, Connectingness and Mental Health with Dr. Martin Polis. I am Loretta Byrne, the Project Manager of Research Match and your host today. All attendees are in listen only mode throughout the webinar to provide the best audio for presentations. Please type your questions or comments into the question box on the webinar control panel. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer discussion session. The webinar is recorded and will be posted on the Research Match YouTube channel. And please take a moment at the end to give us your feedback by completing a very brief survey uh, that you'll see after exiting the webinar. The information and statements expressed on this webinar are not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and viewers should seek their own professional counsel for any medical condition and before altering an existing care plan. So I want to extend a very special thank you to those of you who have joined Research Match to learn about research study opportunities. The image on the right here displays all of the 150,000 Research Match volunteers that are coming from all across the United States. And as a national community of people who are willing to learn about research, you're at the heart of making research studies possible and advanced research. Research Match is not just about one institution or one partner or one research study. We're a nation of many people working together to make change today and for the future. And as of today, the collaborative network that we have put together includes almost 10,000 researchers from 184 research institutions and 63 patient and community advocacy partner organizations. And most importantly, the volunteers, the 150,000 people who have joined. Our presenter today is Dr. Martin Polis, who is the scientific director and president of the Laureate Institute for Brain Research in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Dr. Martin Polis joined the Laureate Institute for Brain Research as the scientific director and president in May of 2014. Prior to this transition, he was a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego, and the director of telemental health at the Veterans Affairs San Diego Healthcare System. Dr. Polis has published over 300 peer-reviewed publications. He is the deputy editor of JAMA Psychiatry and is on several editorial boards of top tier psychiatric journals. Dr. Polis is currently the chair of the ADAA's Scientific Council. Today, I am so pleased to host this webinar so that you can learn more from our partner, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America and Dr. Polis. Our partner, the ADAA, supports Research Match in our mission to advance scientific research. The ADAA's website and social media posts are excellent resources of information Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Polis. Thank you, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, before I get started, let me just tell you just a little bit more about the ADA. Um, it's a wonderful organization because it brings together clinicians, researchers, and consumers, uh, 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 people with uh, problems with anxiety and depression. Um, it has uh, excellent resources uh, on the pay on the newly um, uh, uh, designed uh, web page uh, about local clinicians, um, but also uh, articles about various aspects of mental health that are written by experts in the field um, and that provide really uh, a straightforward talk about uh, topics of interest. So if you have a, a bit of time, um, if you want to explore uh, the website, it's, it's really a fantastic resource. And I'm very, very proud to be uh, part of the organization. I've been the, um, the head of the scientific council for a little bit over a year now. And uh, what we're trying to do is really bring as much information as we can to people all over, uh, all across the country um, uh, to make them better informed about depression and anxiety. And uh, just to kind of uh, very briefly say that depression and anxiety are by far the most common mental health problems um, in, uh, in the world and in the country. Um, and there's, we've still got a long way to go in helping people feel better with these difficult conditions. So um, I think I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen. I'm gonna stop then... sharing, yeah. And thank you, Casey, for hosting this event with me today. Yes, Casey, thank you uh, for being our uh, a technical guru and uh, making this all possible. So let me actually start my, thank you. Uh, 
start my uh, presentation here. Okay, let me go back. Just to, let me just go back. Um, let me just go back just one uh, minute. Um, so um, I will be telling you today about social connectedness um, and mental health. Um, and obviously it's a very apropos topic. Um, it's a topic that um, probably many of you are uh, not just interested in, but you're living it on a day-by-day -day basis. I will be um, first talking about social networks, what, um, how to think about social networks. Um, and then I will talk about the brain science that's behind social networks. Um, and uh, finally, I will, um, um, I will talk about uh, the effects of social isolation and loneliness um, and how they might affect the brain. Um, and lastly, I will be uh, giving you an example of what the study that we've done over the past year. Um, but I will also be uh, uh, at the end, uh, specifically talk about some of the question that some of you who are participating today uh, in this uh, seminar have raised and have brought up. So I'm hoping to kind of address some of those uh, issues. Um, there were a fantastic number of questions and uh, they really inspired me to provide a potential uh, follow-up seminars with other experts because uh, some of those questions, I clearly won't be able to answer all of them. Uh, but I want to thank you all for actually sending them uh, to me and, uh, and uh, you know, giving us uh, uh, your insights. So let me, um, let me get right uh, to it um, and uh, talk a little bit about social networks. Um, social networks, of course, uh, is a very broad uh, uh, topic and it's a very broad um, term. It involves our networks that are connected to uh, friends and family. Um, it involves networks that are connected to uh, work, uh, to leisure activities. And we know that social networks are by far one amongst the most important factors in mental and physical health. And I will talk about this in quite a, a bit more detail in a moment. Um, and that's why it's so important to know about their influence. Um, it, they're also among the most important modifiable factors. What I mean by that is that some of the things, um, uh, you know, we have a hard time changing. But other things we uh, have a bit more, uh, it's a bit more easy to change and to modify. Uh, social networks are certainly among the most um, malleable ways of how to change how we feel and uh, uh, how it affects our mental health. So that's really why I want to talk about this. Um, so there's a number of factors that affect social networks. Uh, uh, the number of times that we're in contact with people, um, and of course, the, uh, the, the number of times and the depth of the uh, relationship is determined by uh, uh, the distance between uh, the network members, uh, number of work colleagues, uh, emotional closeness, um, but also genetic relatedness. So there's uh, also a biological uh, element to it. Um, and so we have to think of these as uh, complex uh, uh, organisms almost uh, uh, that um, where constantly we share information and the information is not just how we speak to one another but also how we behave uh, sometimes how we not behave how we not exchange information um, um, people have uh, studied for a long period of time what is the size what's the typical size of a social uh, network um, and uh, one number that has been coming up uh, uh, over uh, the last uh, uh, decades, and it's uh, been mentioned in the popular press, it's called the Dunbar number. Uh, and the Dunbar number is something that goes back to uh, a study that uh, was done uh, in uh, about 20 years ago that looked at brain size and brain characteristics and then uh, in various species. They looked at uh, um, uh, from monkeys all the way to humans. And what, uh, what they found is that uh, the configuration of the brain correlated with the number of people uh, that, uh, or the number of, not people, the number of uh, uh, co-species that, uh, uh, that the organism was involved in. And for humans, the predicted size was around 150 uh, 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 people. So that became sort of the Dunbar number, the 150. 
Um, there has been quite a bit of um, discussion of whether this is really a, a useful and appropriate way of describing the numbers. Obviously, we know that some people have many more friends on social media than 150. Um, some people have a lot fewer friends. Um, so there's a lot of variability in this, uh, but it sort of um, it gives us a bit of a landmark of where we uh, see uh, the uh, humans are. So this number of 150 is what's uh, referred to as the Dunbar number. Um, this is a study, I'm not going to go too much into the detail, but what uh, we recognize is that this number is not a static number and shouldn't be seen as, oh my God, I don't have 150 friends. I must, there must be something wrong with me. That's not at all the case. Or I have several hundred friends and maybe there's something wrong with me too. That's also not the case. We know that this number is merely a, 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 an average and um, with lots of fluctuation. And that uh, some people even have um, a, a questioned whether we can even extract a single number. So um, I'm saying this uh, because you'll hear still a lot of these numbers thrown around and how many friends should I have? Oh yeah, the Dunbar number says 150. Um, you don't need to feel uh, uh, inadequate or, or something wrong with you if you don't have 150 friends. Uh, uh, the, the main issue here is uh, there's a lot of variability uh, from person to person. Um, the other thing is that, and I saw, as I talked about this before, uh, social networks evolve. We do know, and that is something that actually is um, uh, important to, uh, uh, to recognize, is that social networks um, and the size of social networks tend to uh, decline with age. So, uh, you know, we tend to have relatively more friends when we're younger, and we have, tend to have relative uh, fewer friends when we get older. Um, and the, I'm saying this not that it, it's an inevitability, but I'm saying that, that we should be aware of it and we should begin to think about how can we modify that. So we should prepare ourselves, not when we're in our uh, advanced age and say, oh, I don't uh, have any friends, but we should basically start planning. How do we maintain a good number of friends throughout our lives? And I'll tell you in a moment why that is important. Um, and, um, and so, you know, social networks are um, a, a dynamic, uh, it's a dynamic thing. Um, you can in, you can grow them and you, you can shrink them. Um, now here is where we transition to uh, is is what how do how is our brain made up to process social networks? Um, this is a very influential uh, uh, paper review paper that came out a number of years ago, and um, again without going too much into detail. The core feature here is that social processing is enormously complex and involves uh, really a number of different processes um, that are kind of put here in these boxes and connected with these arrows. Um, so you have uh, sensory processing, seeing somebody, whether it's on Zoom or whether it is in real life. Um, you have expectations of how that person uh, affects you in terms of um, how it makes me feel better, that person makes me feel better, makes me feel worse. Um, you also have ways of how, how do I respond to that person? Maybe I don't respond to that person at all. Maybe I respond to it very strongly. So that's actions. Um, also, uh, it has to, um, to do with, uh, you know, how motivated am I to connect to that person? Um, and how, um, uh, how much feedback do I get from this person and how do I feel? So there are all these different processes, and um, and it, 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 the reason why I put this in here is because it's very clear that there is no one brain area that's the social brain area. So it's not like, oh, we have this little node in the brain that says, okay, here, yeah, I'm the social brain. Instead, what it is, is that the brain is much more a distributed a network of brain uh, structures. And here um, I have a, a view of those uh, uh, brain structures. Um, and, and the impression I wanna leave you with is that it's distributed across the entire brain. Um, there's um, areas uh, such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That's just one part of the brain in the front part of the brain that we often uh, uh, identify as the conductor of the brain. There's sort of the, the, the executive. 
Um, but there are also emotional aspects of the brain, like the insular cortex or the amygdala, um, which is another brain structure. The, the, the key thing is these, uh, these brain structures work in uh, concert with one another when we engage with other people. Um, they have uh, important functions for uh, what's re referred to as social perception, uh, emotion motivation, behavioral adaptations, or how I behave in response uh, uh, to a person. Um, and the other reason why this is important is it shows you how uh, not engaging in social activities can impoverish the brain. Uh, and it's not just impoverishing one part of the brain, but really the brain as a whole. Um, and uh, how engaging in these activities can really enrich the entire brain. Um, and so it shouldn't be surprising that um, social isolation has profound effects on the brain. This was one study that um, uh, really summarized this in a met what's called a meta-analysis that's taking a whole bunch of studies and looking at it and say, okay, what's common? What do we know about social isolation? Um, and the, the, the areas in the brain that you see here color-coded, um, and they, again, they, they have different names and it's not really that important to go into what these names are, but the point being is that, um, that these regions fundamentally function different under social isolation conditions. So when people have uh, fewer friends or they feel they're not connected to, uh, to people, uh, to the outside world. Um, and again, what we're seeing, it's not one area that is affected by it, but it's an entire network of areas. Um, and it's exactly those areas, in many ways, exactly the same areas that I showed you just on the previous slide. So again, we see that as so the social brain is a distributed brain. And uh, uh, when the social brain is not engaged uh, and impoverished, then uh, different brain areas are affected. Um, now, they, that doesn't mean, and it's important to recognize that, that, um, that these things are uh, irrevocably uh, affected. Um, uh, we can relearn and re-engage these areas, but it does mean that uh, the brain dynamically adjusts to the demands of, uh, uh, of social activity or the lack of social activity. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the, what is the effect? Why do we care about social connectedness? Um, and this is again, uh, an analysis that was done in, uh, just recently looking at a large number of studies and looking at what are the effects of uh, social connection or the lack thereof. And what's striking here is that these effects are um, not just for mental health, of course, that's what we're focusing on today, but it's also on physical health, particularly heart disease, um, uh, but also cognitive uh, impairment. Um, uh, and it is, quite frankly, so profound that you uh, see uh, people with reduced social networks and reduced social activities, that they have a shortened lifespan. Um, that that, uh, uh, through various effects, whether it's um, through the health effects or through the mental health effects, really uh, uh, shortens a person's uh, life expectancy. So it shows you the importance of having, of being socially connected. And there's a particular aspect of social connectedness that I wanted to just briefly talk about, and that is uh, loneliness. Um, loneliness is not just um, not having social contact. I know that many people have, um, relatively few social contacts, and they're okay with that. And they're fine, they're content. They are just people that uh, don't need uh, and do not want a lot of social contacts. But there are other people who um, are not connected, but strongly feel they should be connected. Um, and the, the resulting feeling of that is feeling lonely. Um, and, um, and there is a clear um, connection between loneliness and physical and mental health. Um, we know that uh, loneliness um, is associated with a 20% increase in death for both women and men, with the largest effect due to mental health and overall well-being, and some smaller effects on sleep and cognition. So here you have a situation where it's uh, very clear that the disconnect between uh, wanting to connect to other 
and not being connected to others is profoundly impairing uh, uh, the quality, the mental and physical quality of the person's life. Um, and then uh, people have beginning to understand, trying to understand what is the mechanism. When we talk about mechanism, mostly as biological researchers, we want to understand uh, what might be going on uh, on a molecular level, on a cell level, so that we can, you know, find ways of uh, maybe improving that. Um, and so the first thing that people have noticed, and uh, again, this is sort of a, a complicated figure on the right hand side, but really kind of showing the pathways that are affected, directly affected by loneliness. But there are really um, three areas that I, I, I noteworthy here, um, three mechanistic areas. The first is the brain stress pathway. We know that um, loneliness, particularly the, uh, the, the, the feeling of loneliness, uh, the disconnect between uh, wanting to connect and not being connected, that that activates the stress pathway. Now, the stress pathway is a complex pathway. It evolves among other uh, um, things, uh, the cortisol, um, the peripheral cortisol level, but also central uh, 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 brain systems that are involved. Um, that uh, uh, that regulates stress overall, but we know that loneliness is related to brain stress. Um, and stress is linked to all kinds of consequences. Um, stress can affect the immune system. Stress can affect uh, 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 other bodily system. Stress can affect um, uh, 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 directly affect uh, depression. Um, so we know that that's one pathway by which we think it um, uh, loneliness affects uh, overall quality of life, mental and physical. Uh, the next is uh, an interesting path, it's inflammation. Now we all have experienced inflammation. So, you know, say for example, uh, you get stung by a bee uh, and you have a red spot on your skin, uh, that's an inflammatory process. Um, if, you, if you're out, you know, the summer's coming, if you're out in the sun and you are uh, exposed to the sun and you don't put sunscreen on, your skin gets red, that's an inflammatory process. The body responds to stressors, in this case, these are physical stressors, with what we call inflammation. Inflammation uh, activates a whole cascade of different things. Um, but it turns out that even, um, uh, that even mental problems or mental stressors, such as loneliness, cause inflammation. Uh, and it's subtle, and it's not like you can see your skin uh, become, uh, becoming red, but it does affect uh, different organs, including the brain. And so we have now a fairly good understanding that these inflammatory processes can directly contribute to uh, a, a poor mental health as well. And then finally, um, uh, you know, as, a, as another process is when you're lonely, sometimes you do things that may not be a, a good in a general health sense. That you may eat too much, you may drink too much, you may smoke too much, you may do other things. That um, so, uh, in general, that uh, we kind of think of this as poor health behaviors, and poor health behaviors also contribute to uh, uh, you know the, the negative health uh, uh, and uh, mental health consequences of loneliness. So you can see it's not one thing, and that's important to remember. Just like the social brain is not one little area in the brain, but it's a distributed area in the brain, the effects of uh, social isolation or, or the effects of loneliness is not one thing, but it's really a whole group of uh, effects. So um, people are now beginning to actually analyze data. Um, and because of course, we all have been through uh, one of the most uh, um, profound medical uh, events over the last century. Um, so people are beginning to uh, try to analyze uh, the effect of what has COVID done. Uh, now COVID has had enormous effects, uh, obviously medical effects, but also mental health effects. Um, and, uh, and, and also it has affected how we connect to people, right? With, with social distancing, um, with, um, with other ways of uh, you know, being overworked. I mean, I saw, and the questions, a lot of people coming in and saying, how can I have, how can I be connected? I need to take care of my family. I need to take care of my job and I need to, uh, you know, I'm juggling too many things at once. So how can we be uh, well connected during those times? 
What's interesting though, and this speaks to some degree to human resilience. I think we need to uh, uh, be aware that we as humans have gone through very difficult times in historical past. And clearly COVID is a difficult time. But surprisingly, um, the, the, the studies that are currently coming out show that the, uh, that the COVID lockdown has had a relatively modest effect on anxiety and depression. And I'll show you that actually, we have the similar results with our study. Um, and so far, uh, we don't yet see um, a, a lot of evidence for, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, social support disruption, loneliness. Now you may say that's not my experience and I can uh, uh, assure you that uh, there are plenty of people who've gone through enormous um, kind of uh, social uh, upheaval. But if you look at in large scale uh, studies so far, we don't see an overall trend, uh, overall change yet. That's not to say that the long term consequences may not be different. So let me talk uh, a little bit about our study. Um, and in fact, I need to uh, give a shout out to uh, uh, the sister organization of uh, Research Match, the Red Cap folks in, at Vanderbilt, who made it possible with their setting up ways of uh, collecting data that we could actually do this study. Um, so this was, we were interested. So we, we, we are a research institute and we are interested particularly in the mechanisms that underlie anxiety and depression. Um, and by mechanism, just what I said before with inflammation and other kinds of processes. And the reason why we're interested in, because we recognize that the treatments are inadequate. There are many people who are suffering uh, with depression, anxiety, and we don't have the right treatments yet. So we're trying to figure out, are there novel targets, novel treatments that we can discover? So we were interested in, are people with uh, mental health problems, do they have more uh, do they respond more adversely to the COVID situation than people who don't? Uh, and uh, to that end, end, what we did is we enrolled people who had participated in our research before and asked them to, on a monthly basis, fill out a questionnaire and just tell us how they were doing. Um, so to give us an idea of what's been going on um, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So we started this, we were very quick on the response. We started this study uh, April last year, just uh, essentially right after everything started to blow up on us. And then we've been following these people on a monthly basis, um, uh, just like what I told you. And we were asking questions about mood and anxiety symptoms, but also substance and alcohol use, perceived stress, and then also coping uh, with uh, COVID. Um, and I'm going to just show you a few uh, data here, just to kind of give you a sense of wh where we were at. So this is um, uh, this is one of the graphs. I'm going to uh, 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 lead you through it a little bit. So we have here uh, several panels. Each of these panels is a subgroup in our analysis. Overall, there were about 500 people in the study. Uh, they actually, in fact, they're still in the study. Um, and uh, you can see people with different age groups. Um, and here we have healthy control. These are healthy participants. And here we have people with mood and anxiety disorders. Um, and these are people that are previously, again, participated in our studies. They had either depression or some form of anxiety. Um, and then what you see here, the gray uh, lines here, they're called spaghetti plots. Uh, so the, each of these lines is one person. Um, and then what you see here, the blue line is the mean or the average across all of these people over time. And then the, uh, this kind of um, uh, the, these, these shades is sort of the, uh, what's called the error bars or the variability of that mean. Um, now, the first thing that you should see is that on average, all these lines are flat. Um, and they're flat from April to uh, November when we, when we kind of did the first interim analysis. And what that showed us that um, during this period of time, we did not see an increase in uh, depression uh, in this particular case. This is what you see on this axis is the level of depression. Now, what you see is that people with mood and anxiety problems tend to have higher levels of depression. And that's because they have problems with mood and anxiety um, than healthy people who don't. But what you do not see is that any of these uh, lines go up uh, and get worse. Um, and the same is true for if you look at anxiety. Um, you see again um, that uh, uh, you know these lines are relatively flat, 
Um, and you see the line, then the level is higher among people with mood anxiety problems, but also the trend is essentially the same, they're flat. Now, that is to say that on average, we do not see a lot of change, but, and this is why I always love to look at these, uh, what I said, spaghetti plots of each individual person, there's a huge variability. And this is what we're now looking into. It is clear that yes, on average, people are not getting worse, but there are people who definitely are getting worse. There are also people who are getting better. Um, and we need to, and that's what we're looking into now, what, what has made these people getting uh, worse? And what are the factors that we can understand so that in the next crisis or in the next stressor, we can potentially find better ways of uh, intervening. Um, so what do we know about COVID and mental health so far? It's clear, and that is, uh, there's no, uh, that COVID has disrupted our social networks and our support systems. Um, uh, there's, uh, that, th there's a fairly good evidence um, that COVID does affect the brain. We know that uh, uh, for a fact, we have some inkling on how it does that. Um, we know that uh, uh, particular people with uh, long-term uh, COVID consequences have um, uh, symptoms of fatigue. Um, they have symptoms of anxiety or depression, and they have other uh, neurological symptoms that are clearly related to uh, uh, something that's going on in the brain. But we will need a lot more information long-term um, to see how COVID eventually affects uh, our mental health um, and how much of those effects are um, uh, mediated through our uh, changing social networks, our social isolation, our, our disruption um, of our social networks. Um, and so uh, I, I'm showing you this graph, um, coming back to, it, I said at the beginning, um, you know, social uh, uh, connectedness is one among the most important um, uh, modifiable risk factors for mental health. Here's actually a, so a, a, another meta-analysis is, again, the studies of studies, uh, looking at um, what are the most important modifiable uh, risk factors for mental health, um, and in particular for mood disorders, that is depression. And the most important uh, uh, modifiable factors in, uh, the, um, in, in terms of the effect sizes, in terms of how strong the effects are, is social relationships and interactions, sleep, uh, dying, uh, media activity, and this is when we're talking about media, that's a whole nother talk we can go into, which is social media, screen media, um, alcohol and uh, illicit drug use and physical activity. These are all important factors. And, um, you know, it, it, it was also raised in the, in, uh, in the questions that I've received before the talk. Um, you know, what, I, what can I do to improve my mental health? What are things you can do that, uh, uh, and quite frankly, um, these are the ones that really hit home. Now, again, it, it, any one of them uh, to try to improve is not a trivial matter, but uh, knowing that these things are all contributing to overall uh, how you're doing um, is, is very, is very uh, important to know. And then you can start planning, okay, how do I make changes? And we can talk about this uh, even a bit in the discussion today. Um, so what are the take-homes? What do I want to leave you with? And then I go into some of the questions that I wanted to uh, kind of address uh, before we get into the discussion. Um, so in terms of um, uh, the, the first, uh, what I would say is that uh, social networks uh, are among the most important aspects of human experience. Um, it's clear that um, uh, that humans are social creatures. Uh, that's not something that you need research to do, but it is uh, important for, uh, to know that it also contributes profoundly to mental and physical health. Um, the brain is wired to process social networks and it's wired in, in, in quite amazing and complicated ways. And it's uh, uh, distributed across different parts of the brain that involves emotion, that involves how we think, uh, it involves how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about others. Um, and it's very important to know that social networks affect body and brain health. Uh, there's no, and these effects are not uh, negligible. Uh, these effects are uh, quite significant. 
Um, and then uh, stressing social networks may affect uh, brain health, but the evidence uh, is modest. And when I say stressing, I really talk now about uh, the effect of uh, COVID on, uh, uh, on uh, social networks and mental health. We still have to do a lot more work uh, to, um, to fully understand how, they, how this works. Um, and, uh, and then improving social networks could be an important process to target to improve mental health. So, you know, often, again, the, the question is often being asked is, how do I get better? How do I make myself feel better? How do I uh, get less anxious? Um, and, you know, it's very difficult uh, sometimes to directly say, oh, I'm gonna think myself into feeling better. Um, but there are things that you can do that as a consequence will make you feel better. Social networks is uh, one of them. And I'll talk uh, about some more specific aspect uh, in just a moment. So I have two, uh, 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 two slides that I've added after I received some of the questions from, from people who wanted to participate in today's webinar. Uh, so let me walk you through those two slides because I think that there might be uh, quite of interest in. The first one in particular, I think uh, it, it's a few steps to kind of explain uh, um, so this was actually a, a, a research manuscript that we uh, that I've written with two other colleagues uh, about a year, a year and a half ago. Um, and the idea was to help people understand how do we actually perceive uh, the outside world. Um, and I think it's important to kind of um, think about this uh, because a lot of people that uh, were that asked the question, well, you know, I feel like other people are. Um, uh, you know, that I have a hard time connecting to other people. So uh, the, the point that I want to go through is, is how do how do perception work? Now we did, in, in this particular example, we used uh, a, a rabbit and a bear. Uh, the rabbit and a bear is just uh, two uh, potential outside events that we might experience. So we, we find ourselves in, uh, say, in, 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 a, in a forest and we hear a sound and the sound uh, is perceived that we get the sound coming in and we hear and, and but what happens is the brain already has ideas even before the sound even comes in about what might be going on in the forest. So, uh, you know, you can see that uh, as uh, having the idea, oh, there might be a rabbit or there might be a bear in the forest. Um, and then it interprets what comes in in terms of the information in light of what it expects to find. Um, in other words, what we perceive, what comes in, is not simply what comes in, but it's a combination of what we put in and what comes in. And that, as a result, then, is um, with what we call the evidence, okay, we, we now say after we're hearing a sound, we see a rabbit, um, we then modify our internal model of what we expect to see or hear the next time around. So say we saw a rabbit in this particular case, then the next time we'll be much less likely to expect a bear and much more likely to uh, expect a rabbit. That's how essentially in many cases, a healthy brain adapts to its environment. In an anxious brain, what happens is that um, right from the get-go, it's not that we have equal amount of expectation about the rabbit and the bear, but in fact, what we have is the bear tends to prevail. We see the bear everywhere. So we hear a sound, oh, there must be a bear. And even, and this is the important part, even now if we see a rabbit, uh, what happens is that the brain is somehow, and the somehow is what we're currently researching, not able to adjust our idea between the bear and the rabbit uh, so that it doesn't make the rabbit more likely uh, the next time around. So we still think even we hear the sound the next time that it might be a bear. Um, and that helps to explain why some people, when they encounter people from the outside, um, uh, they may react very differently um, to a person based on um, the hypothesis, based on the ideas of what is in, in, in your mind uh, to begin with. And you may ask, okay, so how do these ideas come about? Well, there's a whole host of processes uh, that generate these ideas to begin with. You know, some of the past history, um, your particular personal biological makeup, and, uh, and, and other things. 
uh, other experiences. Um, but the point is that um, you know perception, mm -hmm. seeing a person, connecting to a person, talking to a person, is not just the information coming in from the outside, but it's also about our ideas that we have before the information ever came in. Um, so how do we change? So that's uh, that's a tall order, and of course that we can talk about for a long time uh, a, a, as well. But let me just walk you through a, a, a sort of a, a model that has been kind of uh, used uh, by many many researchers, and now also been applied to you know how do we uh, adjust to COVID nineteen? Um, and the model is called the COM model. Um, it's uh, COM because it uh, emphasizes capabilities opportunities and motivation. So let me talk about those three things. So capability simply refers to um, our, uh, our makeup in terms of uh, what we are physically capable, capable and what we are psychologically capable. Now, these are not immutable things. We can modify them, but, they, but there are certain characteristics that we have. Some people are more social, some people are more, uh, are more physical than others. Some people are more at athletic, so that refers to sort of the, the, the makeup, the, the, the physical, psychological makeup. The next thing is opportunity. Opportunity means exactly what it means. It's like, what is the situation that we expose ourselves that allows for things to happen? Could be physical, could be social. Um, and the third is motivation. Motivation is our uh, intention to actually uh, uh, have and, and, and behave in a certain way. Um, and the two elements of motivation, one is called reflective motivation and the other one is automatic motivation. Now, automatic motivation is important because it often determines uh, a lot of our behaviors that we may not be so happy with. It's essentially our habits, the things that we are, have gotten used to behaving a certain way. Uh, reflective motivation is like you sit down and say, huh, you know, I've been doing, uh, you know, I've been eating uh, vanilla ice cream uh, all my life, but maybe I should try some strawberry ice cream. Uh, so you, you're basically bringing in your, uh, your, your, your brain and, and, and creating an externally generated uh, dialogue with yourself saying, oh, you know, maybe I should be starting uh, eating some different type of ice cream. Or, you know, in, obviously in social connectedness, you may say, you know, I'm, I've been a lonely uh, person or I've been a a uh, person that doesn't really connect to other people. Um, that's your habit. That's your, uh, your automatic motivation. But you may say that, oh, you know, let me uh, see. Maybe I can connect to a person that uh, likes to knit or that likes to paint or that likes to sing or whatever it is. And then you, uh, you basically um, engage your reflective motivation. The point being is that capability, opportunity, and motivation, those are the three factors that in influence behavior and that uh, what you have to bring the bear to change behavior um, and then uh, uh, connected to this is that um, is this uh, second model it's called the prime model and prime again from the different uh, processes the planning the evaluation uh, uh, the motivational motive processes and the impulse uh, uh, inhibition processes the point is that um, we can put this into a framework where we take a step back and say, okay, um, how, how, if I want to change, how do I engage these different processes? How do I engage planning? Uh, how do I engage evaluating? Was it good? Was it bad? Uh, did, it, uh, uh, did it reflect my needs? Um, and then also work with motivation. How strong was my automatic motivation? How strong was my reflective motivation? And were there any other things that kind of intervened and, and came in the middle? Um, now, uh, again, I brought these things up because people often ask, well, how do I change? Um, and, uh, and obviously, uh, for many uh, people, it requires quite a bit of um, engagement. But I, I brought this, particularly this, this, these last two uh, uh, figures, because they are well-developed models in which you can work with people that, uh, uh, that help you to facilitate change. Change is absolutely possible. We understand the processes that facilitate change uh, quite a bit. Um, so I wanna thank you for your uh, attention and I do really wanna spend some time in answering your question. And I think we're gonna have uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, moderate those questions and um, maybe field some of them. I know that there's some open questions already. Yes, thank you, Dr. Polis. This was fascinating. Um, we appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into this. Um, and this is a big topic, big topic, widespread. Um, and we received um, a lot of questions as people were registering for this. So thank you for um, giving us some conceptual ways of um, thinking about that because there's, it would be impossible for us to answer um, all of those questions today, or really I think even answer them thoroughly because they're complex. But um, we'll take a stab at a few of them. Um, we'll, we'll be, there were also some themes in the question. There were several questions. Uh, so I've pulled a few out. Um, in addition to the ones that people are typing in, and we encourage you to go ahead and type your questions into the question and answer box that you'll see there on your screen. Um, okay, so have studies found out anything about the loss of closeness to family members? On top of the pandemic in the last year, um, this attendee has said that um, they've lost both their parents and now they're much more distant from the rest of their immediate family, like um, their brother, because of the loss of the parents that were, you know, probably the key source of all the siblings and staying together. Um, so have studies found out anything about the loss of closeness to family members? Yeah, so, so, so there's a whole uh, uh, literature on bereavement. And many years ago, I was actually a, a tiny bit involved in some of this uh, work. Um, so, you know, so it's bereavement, obviously loss of parents has profound uh, biological consequences, similar to loneliness. It affects the immune system. It affects inflammatory processes. So it does have biological effects, but obviously it also has psychological effects. Um, and um, in fact, we're now just beginning to look at this in a new study where we're looking at different cultural aspects. There's some cultures in in, in our country that are very strong familial uh, oriented that have multi-generational families um, and, um, and and social support is tightly linked to um, to having all these members interact and just uh, as I said before um, the loss of social connectedness has these profound consequences um, I, I, I can imagine that we will see uh, a, a, an effect beyond the biology onto uh, the, uh, the psychology. And, and this is what I said also before is that social networks are dynamic, right? So this is a good example where maybe the, the family was together, and was a social network. Now two key members of that social network have, uh, 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 have disappeared, unfortunately. And the network is now falling apart or it's not as, as close as it was before. So then it goes back to how do I recreate or how do I create a new the network? And that is, I think, an important thing. So the, the first step is to just know that social networks are changing and changing whenever a member comes or goes. Um, and then when the change is towards the, um, if the change has negative consequences, we need to step back and say, what can we do to improve or recreate the network? Um, so yes, bereavement has profound consequences biologically. It has uh, profound cons uh, consequences psychologically and networks will change as a consequence. And we have to um, find ways of recreating the network that we prefer. Okay, um, uh, this was a, uh, a question that was offered uh, as part of the registration. Um, what are the first steps to reaching out to someone who has self-isolated in addition uh, to the pandemic isolation? There are several mm -hmm. questions around that, maybe a family member, a child. Um, so yeah. this may not be the person, but it's somebody significant in their life that has now isolated themselves. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And, and um, again, the, uh, the, the important aspect is initially just uh, the noticing without necessarily the judging, right? The, the, the big issue is that we don't want to start with saying, oh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you isolate yourself, something bad, but to just see, well, I noticed that, um, you know, you, uh, you, you don't, you're not connected to a lot of people. 
Um, and, and just hear from that person, well, what does that mean to that person? You know, again, as I said, some people are completely fine with not being socially connected. Most of us are not. Um, and we know, particularly among young people, there's an, a kind of a, a loneliness epidemic uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is developing. And we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how to, how to counteract that, which is, seems counterintuitive. You have all these social media activities going on and yet people feel increasingly lonely. But the first step really is to just notice and, and just saying that, uh, listen, I see that um, you know, you're telling me you're not meeting up with people. How do you, you know, how does that make you feel? How do you, uh, um, and, and, and draw the person out, not necessarily saying, oh, you should be meeting with people, you should be doing this, that, or the other thing, because it, it allows for an open communication. And, and the reason why that is important is because then you can identify the factors that may have contributed. Maybe the person stopped playing a, a certain, maybe they used to be on a softball team, or maybe they uh, used to collect uh, uh, stamps nobody collects stamps anymore, but maybe they used to do something <laughs> that they don't do anymore. And uh, then you have an in and you can say, well, listen, maybe this is an opportunity to, to, to kind of reconnect. Yeah. Okay, so drawing them out with some open-ended questions yes. and, and calling them or reaching out to them, even if it yes. maybe doesn't go well, because many times with people who have isolated themselves, the conversations are very difficult. Absolutely. I'm fine. And, and should, it's usually the answer. I'm fine. Exactly. And we should, <laughs> so the, the, the point here is we should be okay with the person initially feels, um, in, you know, the expectation should not be, oh my God, I'm so glad you asked, or, uh, uh, or I'm so glad that you're calling me. That shouldn't be our expectation because part of the problem is that uh, there is no connection, right? So, so if, the, if it's a little rocky in the beginning, that's okay. It's okay if the person says, oh, yeah, I don't want to talk to anybody or I don't want to be involved in anything. Um, it's, it's the continued non-judgmental effort uh, that can make a difference. Um, and, um, and, and just be the concern, right? Because, um, it, and you can even uh, say, you know, I'm, I'm concerned because I've heard, you know, these uh, uh, people who are isolated, uh, it affects their biological and their mental health. I just want to know how you do it. Yeah. Uh, we have several questions that I'll sort of try to wrap up um, together um, around being forced into uh, isolation during COVID. And some people um, have been lucky enough to be able to work remotely from home um, and keep their jobs. Um, but now they're, they're isolated at home. Um, so for yeah. some, as, as I'm seeing in the questions, it's forced us to reconnect with ourselves. Uh, mm -hmm. Extensive amounts of alone time <laughs> have forced us to reconnect with ourselves, whether we, you know, whether that's a good thing or not. Um, one question is, what do you think about, you've mentioned social media. Um, some may be helpful, some may not be helpful. Yeah. And, um, I'll let you speak to that, please. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, I definitely have something to say about the social media, but uh, before, I mean, even if you have extensive alone time, um, it, we part, sometimes people tend to kind of get into like a black hole when they, uh, when they in alone time, when they kind of get into thinking about themselves. And, um, and, 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 and in order to kind of prevent that a little bit, one thing is to, uh, kind of take an explicit inventory in some ways, you know, kind of, you know, jot down some notes on the computer or, you know, what are the, what are the important things in your life? What do you have? What is you important for you? Uh, what are the things, the things you strive for? What are the things that uh, make you feel good? Um, what are the things that you enjoyed? And sometimes you need to think of good things in the past. And that is essentially taking inventory of who you are uh, as a person. Um, and who you may not be currently because of the social isolation, but it gives you a goal towards uh, to work towards. So that's, uh, you know, sometimes the alone time can be helpful in uh, generating sort of this internal inventory, make it explicit. It also helps you not getting into a, uh, going down a rabbit hole. Now to social media. Social media, it, it is a complicated topic and we've done a little bit of research of this over the last years 
it is true, you know, uh, discussion groups and support groups, and that can be very helpful because they have like-minded people that form networks and they can be very powerful, but it can also be problematic. Um, and that is, uh, we tend to, in many social media outlets, only present one aspect of ourselves, right? I mean, uh, uh, in, in, in my field in research, it's all about, you know, publishing and getting grants, getting funded. And so, and so what you see is you go on various uh, media and everybody uh, says, oh, I published this paper and I published this uh, manuscript and I got this grant and that grant. And pretty soon you think everybody else is successful and only I am uh, uh, kind of lacking behind. But of course, it's completely biased, right? Because people are not saying, oh, you know, I, I, I send in my manuscript to 10 different places and they all didn't want to see it or they, I sent in five grants and none of them got uh, supported. And so you don't see that. Um, and in that particular case, um, uh, people are developing all kinds of inadequate feelings. You know, they feel like I'm not good enough. I'm not, uh, so, so that's where I feel like there's a, a, a very powerful um, kind of, you have to be very careful. You have to have a certain um, social media hygiene. You have to recognize that what you're seeing on social media is not the whole person. It's a it's a it's an image that the person wants to, wants you to see, and most of the time it's a good image because they don't want you to see the the struggling image. Um, so it's important that uh, you don't necessarily see oh yeah just because I don't do this that and the other thing I'm I'm less than the other person that does this and puts it on the, on social media. And in that sense, social media can be problematic, but it, it can be helpful as uh, as a as a, a source of support, and they can be problematic as a source of social comparison where you feel for some reason you're not living up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know the website uh, at the ADAA um, has many resources um, yeah. that go into depth and lots of um, uh, tips too as to uh, things to consider. You posted um, many other webinars yourself. Uh, well, uh, the ADAA has um, on mm -hmm. many topics that are uh, I've, I've been following you on Twitter for some time, and um, I've, um, I, I can't imagine anybody who wouldn't find these resources helpful if you're a human being, um, you know, especially around the holidays and, and times like this where um, we're, we're confronted with now going back out into society. Uh, we yeah. just got started to get comfortable staying home. Um, well, and, and, and that may be one thing that we should, uh, I know we're uh, running a little bit uh, short of time, but I wanted to bring up one thing that uh, several people have brought up, you know, that uh, it's like, and, and it's very apropos, right? We know uh, for the last few days, the CDC has completely changed uh, um, the mask mandate situation and out of a sudden it's, uh, for vaccinated people, it's all good to go uh, without masks in almost all uh, non-medical situations. And you know, a lot of people saying, geez, I got just used to wearing the mask and it gave me a little bit of protection. And, 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 and I feel protected, not just medically, but maybe psychologically a bit too. And so now I have to change again. And in fact, we went through this even within our institute. Uh, so um, so uh, it, one has to recognize that change whether it comes from the outside or from the inside, can always be a, a, a challenge. Um, and so the first thing is just to recognize, now that I've gotten used to wearing my mask, it's okay to be a little confused, a little anxious, um, not to wear a mask. Uh, and that, um, you know, it'll, there'll be a transition period from feeling comfortable, uh, uh, you know, just walking around without a mask. Um, and the feelings that come up when you're doing this is important because they tell you something about yourself um, and, uh, and you know, kind of taking an inventory of what do I think, well, what's going on here? Um, I think can be very important and very insightful uh, for yourself. But I, I, I absolutely think it is a, it's a normal response to feel uncomfortable whenever, uh, uh, whenever change occurs. And we just went through a, a major change again uh, on the nationwide basis. Yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Paulus. This has been very informative. I, I love your approach. And again, I'm sorry that we couldn't answer all of the questions, but it was um, 
many of them are personal and we simply can't get to that. But the, the website um, hosts a lot of webinars, even on the fear of vomiting, on suicidal ideation, on uh, coping tips, on isolation, um, working with teenagers, working with the elderly, uh, you know, or specific for those, those groups. Um, and so I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. I'll give you a minute at the end, Martin, to, to speak again, but I do want to just encourage everybody to log on to Research Match, find studies that are interesting to you. Uh, you can go to our Trials Today page and find studies across the, the United States and also our network page, which has a link to the ADAA, Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Um, so thank you, Dr. Polis. Any last words? Well, again, I want to thank all the participants today, and um, I want to thank for all the questions. Um, I, as I said, I will prepare other uh, presentations by others Wonderful. to hope, hopefully address those issues. Great. And then we'll break it down into some smaller topics. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>